those sweet silver bells all seem to say, throw cares away, Christmas is here, bring a cheer to you, young and old, young and old, young and the old, ding dong ding dong, that is their song, ring, joyful ring, all caroling, one seems to hear words of good cheer from everywhere, filling the air, oh how they come, raising the sound, going in the day, joy on the earth, the ring, while people sing songs of good cheer, Christmas is here, ding dong ding dong, that is their song, ring, One seems to hear words of good cheer from everywhere, filling the air. Oh, how they bow, raising the sound, boiling and gay, turning the tail. Gaily they ring while people sing songs of good cheer. Christmas is here. Dee, merry, 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 is the song. Ring, joyful, ring, all is the Born on this end, on without end. Dear joyful tone to every home. Dawn on this end, dawn without end. Their joyful tone to every home. And Christmas is here, and we are so glad that you are joining us tonight for our virtual Christmas Eve service. And although we can't be together and worship like we normally do on Christmas Eve, we still come together because Jesus is the reason for the season. So let's worship together as we lead you in singing three of our favorite Christmas carols. Methodist Church in Broken Arrow and those joining us online, we're so glad to be celebrating with you and your family this Christmas Eve. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to come and to worship you in this space, wherever we may be, in our homes, our kitchen tables, in our living rooms. We're so thankful that we can join together online 
uh, with the beauty of this technology. Lord, as we hear your word proclaimed, as we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, may you make room in our hearts and our minds for you this Christmas season. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. verses 8 through 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. There will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger.
Luke 2, 13 through 16. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Let me say again how glad we are that you've chosen to join us on this very special night. We're glad that you're a part of our worshiping congregation on Christmas Eve. Let's pray together. Lord, on this holy night, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. Lord, you're our rock. You're our redeemer. Amen. There's an expression that has been used a lot this year. I've heard it on almost every newscast. I've used it myself many a time. The expression is, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Now, growing up in uh, Oklahoma, I didn't go through a lot of tunnels. Uh, if I did, I could always see the light at the other end because the tunnel was maybe 10 feet long. 
you know, going under an overpass or something like that. So the expression didn't really have a lot of impact for me growing up. Then about, oh, 25 years ago, my wife Janine and I decided that we would try skiing. Now, she had done it a couple of times when she was younger. I'd never gone, but we decided to go to Colorado and go skiing. So we drove to Colorado, we got to Denver, and then we drove the road that leads from Denver up into the mountains, up to Breckenridge. And as you're driving from Denver to Breckenridge, you go through a tunnel that's called the Eisenhower Tunnel. And this is a tunnel that goes through the mountain that is almost two miles long. It's one of the longest tunnels in North America. And I didn't realize how long it was. And we're, It's in the middle of the day, and we're driving, and we enter this tunnel, and it suddenly becomes as dark as night with a few lights above. And it went on and on and on. And for an Okie like me, I thought, how long does this tunnel go? And it just kept turning and going. And it felt like forever. Now, in reality, it was about two miles. So it probably took, you know, under five minutes for us to go through that two-mile tunnel. But it felt like such a long time. And there was a sense of relief when I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And maybe I understood finally that expression. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Now, we've been saying that expression a lot over the last almost 10 months because we feel like we've been in a dark tunnel and we're longing for that light at the end of this dark tunnel that's called a pandemic, that's called COVID-19. And as we've journeyed on and on and month after month, we keep saying, there's got to be some light at the end of that tunnel. And we've grown frustrated and we've grown tired and anxious and weary. And of course, here lately we've had a glimmer of light as vaccines have started to be now distributed and, uh, and are being put into people's arms. And we think, well, all right, this is the beginning of the end because we want to get to the end of this tunnel. We want to see the light. Now, this is an unusual, an exceptional, a, a crazy year, but about every time this year in the middle of winter, we kind of start to long for light. We are near the winter solstice, and today, Christmas Eve, I looked it up, there's only about 10 hours of daylight today, December 24th, Christmas Eve. And let me tell you a little secret, not to, not to blow your mind, but we don't actually know that tomorrow, December 25th, is the day that Jesus was born. If you read the Bible, if you read the accounts of Jesus' birth, there's no dates there. It doesn't say on December the 25th this happened. We don't we don't know the day of Jesus' birth, so why do we celebrate it on December 25th? Well, for centuries now, the church has been doing that, and I believe it goes back centuries to the idea that we celebrate Jesus' birth in the middle of the darkest time of the year because the message of Christmas is all about light piercing the darkness. The message of Christmas is all about light coming into a dark world. In the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, as he is speaking and looking forward to the time that God would send a Savior, that God would send a Messiah, Isaiah says this in Isaiah 9-2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, by the first century, the time of Jesus' birth, the first century in Israel, it felt pretty dark. It was a pretty dark time. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, had lived under the dominion of one empire after another. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. Israel was under the dominant heel of the Roman Empire. And people, well, their lives were difficult. Most people were poor. Life was, was hard. And for Jewish people... The glory days, well, they seem so far away. Jewish heroes like, like Moses and, and Joshua and David felt like ancient history. They felt like ancient history because they were ancient history. They were centuries ago. As a matter of fact, by the first century, the time of Jesus' birth, it had been over 400 years since even a prophet had come to the people of Israel. It was a dark time. And into that dark time, 
into our dark time, there comes light. And that light started in the most, well, unusual of ways. A young peasant girl in an obscure village in Galilee is visited by a a messenger from heaven, an angelic messenger, an angel from God. And this messenger tells this, this young peasant girl that she has been chosen. Of all the women on earth, she has been chosen to bear the Messiah, the Savior, the the Son of the living God. And this message to this young woman is, is frightening and confusing. It says she's puzzled and confused and frightened, and, and she begins to say, how is this even possible? She tells the angel that she's a virgin. She, she tells him that she's engaged to the village carpenter. Most scholars believe that Mary, this young woman, was probably still a teenager. But the angel reassures her, calls her blessed, says that among all women, she has found favor with God. And young Mary accepts the role that she has been chosen for. She accepts God's mysterious plan. She goes and tells her fiancé, Joseph, he doesn't believe a word of it. Would you? He decides that she's covering up an adulterous affair. He decides to be rid of her. But an angel visits Joseph as well and tells him that every word Mary has told him is true. And so they come together and they begin to prepare to make a home for this child in the village of Nazareth in Galilee. But they're interrupted by news of a tax census that the Roman government has proclaimed throughout the empire. And Joseph, being a descendant of the great King David, must go to his home country, his home territory, to register for this census. Joseph's family is from the south, from a little village called Bethlehem. Bethlehem was known primarily as the birthplace of the great King David. If if they'd had signs in those days like we have today, it would have said, you're now entering Bethlehem, home of David. And so Mary and Joseph had to travel 70 miles to the south to this place called Bethlehem. When they arrived, there was nowhere for her to have the child, for she went into labor. And as you know, they ended up having their child, her firstborn, in a barn, in a stable. Now that's the story we tell every year about this time. Matthew and Luke tell us the details of this story, and it fills us with wonder, it it fills us with joy, it It amazes us that this is how God brought His child, His Son, into the world. Now, the Gospel of John tells us the story in a different way. The first chapter of John begins this way. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, Jesus is the light of all mankind, of all humanity. The baby that was born in that stable, to that peasant couple, In the city of David, a a thousand years after King David, that child, the child that the angels told the shepherds about, that child that the Persian magi, the astronomers, astrologers came from Persia to bring their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, that child who grew to be that man, Jesus, is the light of the world. The light that shines in the darkness the light that pierces the darkness. He is the light at the end of every tunnel that we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in tunnels of despair, tunnels of depression. Sometimes we dig the tunnels ourselves. We dig a tunnel of of sin and rebellion and we walk in the dark and we long for light. We long for hope and joy and peace and love 
And Jesus is the light at the end of those tunnels. Jesus pierces the darkness. Some of you remember a story that was in the news a couple of years ago. June 23rd, 2018, a youth soccer team in Thailand, 12 boys ages 11 to 16 and their 25-year-old assistant coach, they went exploring in a cave in Thailand. But shortly after they went into the cave, there was a torrential rainstorm. It flooded the cave, blocking any way out or in. And the boys and the coach were left, well, prisoners, stranded in darkness with little food and water, with flashlights that burned out quickly. And for the first week in that cave, the rains continued so horrendously that no rescue effort could even be attempted. No contact with the boys or the coach could be made. For the first week, there was no hope. The rains finally stopped, and as the boys huddled in the cave on a shelf above the waters, outside the cave, an international effort was coming together to rescue these boys. An international effort that eventually involved almost 10,000 people from 18 different countries. After a little over two weeks in the cave, two weeks in the dark, specially trained divers went in to rescue those boys. And all the boys and the coach were rescued. But one of the divers, Saman Kunan, a 37-year-old former Thai Navy SEAL, died in the attempt, drowned, saving the boys. He died to rescue them. He died to deliver them from the darkness. He died to deliver them from the floodwaters. He died to deliver them from death. 2,000 years before that, in the Middle East, a child was born in a stable. The child grew up in this small village in Galilee. The man that he became then spent three years wandering and traveling and teaching and preaching and healing, doing miraculous things. And when he was 33 years old, he was executed. Executed by the Roman government at the urging of the Jewish religious authorities who saw him as a threat to their power and control. He laid down his life to pierce the darkness. He laid down his life to rescue us from the tunnel of dark sin. And today, he delivers us. He delivers us from the power of sin and the power of death. Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, the man who died on the cross, the man who rose again on the third day, he is the light, the light of all mankind. He is the light at the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel of sin and despair. This night, this special night, this holy night, we celebrate that light. We celebrate the light of hope and peace and joy and love. We celebrate the light of Christ, for the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Would you pray with me? Precious Lord, on this special night, we praise you. We thank you for bringing light into the darkness, for rescuing us, for helping us to be able to live in the light, the light of love and peace and joy and hope, the light of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. On this special night, we remember the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But one of our great traditions on Christmas Eve is also to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. For the baby who was born in Bethlehem grew to be the man, the man who traveled around Galilee and Judea teaching and preaching, the man who laid down his life for us, the man who shed his blood, that we might have life, that we might have the forgiveness of sins. And so, I'd invite you now as we celebrate this sacrament of Holy Communion. Over the last week or so, many of you picked up a small communion kit from our church. 
that allows us to celebrate communion anywhere we are. If you did, I'd invite you to take that out now. If you didn't, that's okay. I'd invite you to take really any bread or any juice that you might have, that you can celebrate this sacrament with us on this holy night. I invite you now as we listen to the words of the communion liturgy. We pray and we thank God that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, Father, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to eat and drink and allow the love of Jesus to feed you, to nourish you, to nourish your heart as we remember the night of his birth, as we remember the night before he went to the cross, as we remember the glorious morning in which he rose again. Christ is risen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Over the last four Sundays, we've lit the four candles of the Advent wreath. The candle of hope, the candle of peace, the candle of joy, the candle of love. And tonight, Christmas Eve, we've lit the final candle, the center candle, the Christ candle. We remember that the light of Christ shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Over the last week or so, many of you have picked up a kit from the church that includes a candle like this. I'd invite you to get that out now. I invite you, whether you're by yourself or with family or with an extended family, to make sure everyone has a candle. The light, one candle. And then pass the light from person to person. And then hold those candles as we prepare to sing together a wonderful arrangement of Silent Night that we call Peace, Peace. Let's hold our candles high and remember as we sing that Jesus is the light of the world.
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so glad that you were part of this Christmas Eve celebration. Have a wonderful day tomorrow. God bless you. Merry Christmas.